Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> now that relies on Keelan pressing the button, which you can do now, to be fair. Welcome back. <laughs> oh, So this much is more epic in the headphones. This is already so weird without headphones. Yeah, we haven't done this in a while. It feels a lot more mm. like actually like we're talking to you rather than I don't know. The headphones <laughs> create a weird separation. <laughs> like he's touching cameras. What's going on? Mm. We're yeah. all good. We've uh, we've managed to cram way more people in here than we usually have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well uh, okay. I this, this would never happen. Let's uh, let's be formal. Welcome back to the merch podcast. Uh, we are joined by Max Henry and Christine. Have, have you taken his surname? Not officially, but I plan to. It's just paperwork that I haven't done. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I see. I've, I'm yet to get married, so I don't know what the uh, the requirements are. But uh, you have to like just file it with like social security. So it doesn't just automatically happen. And, yeah, no, it doesn't automatically happen. Oh, I thought you know, God and just automatically. <laughs> Imagine that sure. just automatically oh. on your passport as well. Yeah. Just, yeah, and that's the that's the issue is like there's a lot of money involved in changing your name because you've got to now get a new passport get a new license get wow a lock, really uh, yeah change the mortgage title like there's way too much and so i just it seems very daunting and i'm sure it's not actually as hard as i have set it up in my head but i opened up the very first form to change my social security number and it was like what's your parents social security number your place Jeez. of birth it was just all it ended up being like two more questions and i was willing to and i stopped so i didn't go and what's far. your actual surname dietrich which is way dietrich. cooler than henry so like <laughs> I did actually debate taking her surname. It's like uh, Sarah has has said that she won't take my surname. Like Daisy is named after me because I'm the only male Campbell Longley in my family and therefore I've got to continue the fucking legacy. But um Sarah's like if we get married, like she's staying Greenfield and I'm like, that is completely fair enough. Yeah. Like, I don't care. Yeah. My last name is made up also. Really? But my yeah, my granddad on my dad's side was adopted and he, he, they're all Jewish and he it was like right after World War II and he's like, you know, really gonna go with a not Jewish sounding last wow. name. So he just made wow. up Henry because he was adopted from like a Jewish Russian yeah, family yeah, yeah. in Russia. Oh, wow. And then, uh, yeah, my mom's side of the family is uh, more OG, but Max Dietrich sounds incredibly German. So I was like, ah, that's gonna be <laughs> maybe I like it. I like it. Nose. Yeah, true, true. Yeah, very good point. <laughs> and then she started the paperwork and I'm like, well, if it's too much for her, it's certainly gonna be too much effort for yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I guess so my mother never changed her name when she married my father. Uh, okay. And so like, but she always like informally went by like the name, Mary yeah. Dietrich and, but never like legally changed it. And I almost thinking that's the route to go. Yeah. Like, informally mm -hmm. use Henry, but formally just leave it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That sounds smart. You don't need to pay anything. Yeah. Right. Or like do any work. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there's a few things we need to clarify. One, we're not wearing headphones, which is terrifying. We we simply don't have enough. And there's also a hilarious story involving Sam losing two pairs of very expensive headphones. Um, <laughs> That's amazing. Additionally, we only have three mics because Bloggy's mic, which we would technically have here for our second guest, is hardwired into the floor. And I would have to peel that up. And also, professional. we're yeah. only, we've, we've now invented a rule that we are only allowing to get, we've always said we'll always only have one guest because it gets too chatty. But we had our first married couple here and we were like, well, and, and they're both involved in this project that we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about. So it was like, fuck it. This will be the new rule. You can only come on the podcast with a second person if you are legally in a binding contract with them. Yeah, I mean, Mar we're, we're legally or. one entity. So, yeah. you know, so just kind of kind of counts. Exactly. I'm but, legally no longer a human. <laughs> <laughs> Legally, I, I, it's nice. It's funny because I, I, when you were when I when I saw you the other day, I'd forgotten that you got married because I think COVID just did make it hard to. There was so much stuff happened, and also such little mm. stuff happened. But yeah, congratulations. Yeah, Thanks. was it nice? It, was. it looked nice. It was lovely. Yeah, yeah. We just started talking about it before we turned the mics on. And it sounded sick. Yeah, basically just a house party. <laughs> so good. <laughs> my my favorite part that people didn't know which i thought this was obvious but brandon douglas married that. us yeah yeah and so brandon and kira are our best friends and live in denver and stuff and it was just like hey brandon we need somebody to marry us and in colorado legally anybody can marry you like oh, you can marry really? yourselves yeah you don't need to be ordained or anything 
And Wait, wow. what, what does this mean? Wait, it's you can good. marry yourself? Like, you like, can basically be your own a, witness. You don't, like, in, Eng- in England, oh, oh, you don't you require mean, a priest or an ordained oh, official no. to, like, witness the marriage for it to be legally binding. Yeah. So Brandon did that. Yeah, Brandon guys. married us. <laughs> and so we all just, like, went up on a mountain, uh, like, an hour and a half from Denver and basically got, like, this sick cottage that was an Airbnb. That's so sick. Rented it out for two days and invited, like, our family and basically just the people who would have been in the wedding party. Yeah. Which and, is exactly the way it should be. Yeah. Right? And you just like had a house party and a bonfire and like awesome food and hung out. Yeah. That's really cool. That's how a wedding should be. I, uh, cause in, yeah, in England, I think to get married, you have to, if you're going to go down like the proper route, i.e. not like civil partnership or whatever, I think you have to do it with a, a sort of legally obligated person, but also there's like, you have to do it under a structure. So really, yeah, and you wow. can do it outside, and they've literally just changed the law now. Mm. You you can do it outside, but you have to have a like an arch thing to signify like a roof. Right, and they've just it rained so much here, probably. No, but it's not. It's <laughs> like it can be like a wicker thing or whatever, but it has to be like I can't remember what it's called. But they just changed it because in COVID, because of regulations, they were like, we can't have everyone limited to these fucking arches. Yeah. So they just changed it. Mm. Um, Interesting. Anyway, uh, other thing we should touch on before it disappears is we are current. What are we drinking? Oh. Uh, yeah, this is uh, some Trias Cafe from my coffee shop that I work at. <laughs> As you this is actually my me. first sip. I mean, did you bring it? You brought it from? Yeah, I roasted oh. it on Wednesday, so I guess it's like a little bit um, a week old today. I've brought us exactly. old beans. It's um, so good. beans. Yeah, I'm sad that I made myself one, and then the air press exploded on me, and we needed to do the podcast so i'm just sharing with christine but this is oh, very, this no is very nice it's very smooth oh, cheers mm. man yeah. and nice temperature it's not too hot which is not necessarily <laughs> you but timing <laughs> timing you, you waited an appropriate amount of time yeah, to yeah, enjoy yeah. it um so what goes into roasting beans because i n- have no idea yeah it's <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not that. I don't know if anyone heard that. But I think Bloggy just exploded in the corner. I held it. Was that a sneeze? Yeah. I that. Just let let it out, Bloggy. Let it out. We've got a slightly hungover Bloggy behind yeah. the camera. We try to avoid the expulsion of any bodily fluids when preparing food products. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's the number one. Uh, no, it's it's pretty fun. I when I moved to Denver, Christian Green, who's a, another parkour person out there, was working at a coffee shop. Yeah. And I really like coffee and since i went to copenhagen and hung out with like jim and joe ollie thorpe and jim yeah, and joe yeah. and julius and those guys they're all thomas omled is like a coffee. coffee beast <laughs> yeah so yeah when i moved I'm like that'd be a cool job and casey as well right yeah Kevin, casey yeah. wilson and um our shop's also a roastery and so it was the only place that I'd seen where you could learn to be like a barista, but you also learned to roast. To roast, okay. And then I got really heavy into the roasting side, um, which is cool. And so now I do a lot of the roasting. And so what? How do you roast? Yeah. What does that actually mean? Green? I just know it yeah, for, so you for take, a word, but I don't even know what it looked like to roast. Yeah, so a coffee bean is basically like the pit of a cherry. Mm. And it's processed in a couple different ways, but the- Wait, wait, an actual cherry? Yeah. So oh, cherry, not like, that not like the like cherries that grow here, but yes, the okay. fruit of the coffee tree is functionally a cherry. Yes, okay, it looks yeah. exactly like one. Wow. And the fruit. That's a, I think you can. I'm not 100% sure. Caffeinated. No, it's just, I think it's just the bean, fruit. not the pulp that's caffeinated. Oh. Um, and then you just like wash the pulp out mm. and process it and dry it. And then you get the green coffee bean and then that goes into a roaster what's a roaster so it depends there's two different kinds we we're going to talk about parkour just be we patient will, will. be patient because this is the educational part yeah. <laughs> we use one called a fluid bed roaster which is basically like a giant popcorn machine it just uses hot air to circulate the beans wow and then you manually can control um basically like the rate of uh heat like the rate of increase in temperature and also uh, like how much circulation and airflow you're getting. And is this one of those things where like some coffee nerds are like, oh, he used 200 PSI pressure in this temperature. <laughs> and other people are like, no, oh, I prefer 8, 850 PSI. There's like, a like roast, roaster tracking software. So you can like track the, basically the slope of the graph of like heat bean temperature to air temperature. And generally like the smoother the slope is, the smoother the roast profile will be. And the better, in some ways, like the better the flavor you'll be able to get out of the bean. But there's different ways that you like, depending on, yeah, what 
what part of the roasting process you're at, like the bean will crack open at different times because the density is changing as you're heating the inside versus the outside. So it's really fun. You learn a lot of cool stuff. Wow. My, my like box ticking for coffee is just like, does it taste somewhat like coffee? Yes. <laughs> does it give me energy? Yes. Does it make me poo? Yes. <laughs> like, cool. Not that I use it explicitly for pooing, but like, you know, you get an old. It helps. Thing. I mean, it at helps. the end of the day, it's like if you like it, that's the main thing, yeah. right? It's so, a nice beverage in the morning and also yeah. for podcasts and things. And also, mm -hmm. preferably that it's not like picked and grown by people who are functionally slaves in another mm -hmm. country. Good so point. Getting Good fair point. trade coffee yeah. and coffee that's sustainably grown because, well, yeah, a lot of coffee destroys rainforests in Brazil and Sumatra. And that's no bueno. But I'm assuming the stuff you brought us is A yeah. grade. No, we do all uh, organic <laughs> <No>. and <laughs> <laughs> trade. No, no, but, nope. you know, slave coffee. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, all right, we should we should move on. But firstly, we, we, we need to do a little bit of background on you too. Um, I don't know your background. Yeah, I, I feel like a lot think. of people, I, a lot of people know Max, probably unfortunately less so you, but Max has, I've, you've spent a lot of time in Europe, but I do want to touch on Christine because I wanted to ask this yesterday and I couldn't remember. I swear you have a really cool job. Yeah. And and also you wake up at 4.30 to exercise and then go to this job. So I'm like, <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I build spaceships. Yeah, what? I knew it. I knew it was something to do with like, I, I, yeah, I had like NASA in my head and shit. And I was like, I swear it's something like that. Yeah, so I, I work in aerospace. So I work for a, a company called Sierra Space, which is designing a transport. <laughs> like, what the fuck? <laughs> a transport <That's> vehicle. <laughs> To, uh, to resupply the International Space Station. So basically NASA has, um, they have the ISS, or not, NASA doesn't have it, but the International Space Station exists and yep. they need to bring cargo up to it and eventually also, like they also need to bring people back and forth. So we have a contract to build a vehicle to bring cargo from Earth up to the space station and back down. Um, and then, so our vehicle looks basically like a miniature space shuttle. Yeah. And does it have to, or could you make it look epic? <laughs> so what's cool about our vehicle that makes it different than like the, the capsules that they just send up and down yeah. is that we actually land on a runway. Um, so your access to your cargo and your science is way faster than if you just dumped your capsule in the ocean and I have to go fish sick. it out and yeah, 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 yeah. So it's, it's super sick. So I work the, the avionics, which is effectively like the nervous system of the spacecraft. So yeah. it's like the computers, the brain, and then interfacing all of the sensors. So like the GPS, the like radar system to see how you can land, the, the um, components that allow you to like approach the space station that tell you your distance away. Wow. Um, so I interface all of that stuff. Back. The important stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's really freaking cool. How did you get into it? What the fuck? Uh, that's actually a cool story. That ties us back to parkour, and then we can go on from there. Oh, well, there's oh, another wow. question I want to ask about spaceships as well. Oh, uh, okay. So, um, yeah, so I was working- I've got so many questions, actually. So I was <laughs> going to and like working at Apex, um, Apex Denver. Yeah. And one of the members at Apex was, a, was an engineer. I was getting an engineering degree. I then was like, hey, is you, do you guys take Internships. I had a friend who actually, I think she actually ended up asking the question for me because I think I was probably shy. And he was like, yeah, yeah, give me your resume. And I gave him my resume. And then eight months later, they're like, I never got the internship, by the way. Um, but eight months later, they offered me a job. Wow. So, wow. That was pretty cool. So actually, I, parkour, thank yeah, you. Yeah, there was a link there. Yeah. <laughs> That's, That's like, so cool. It's really cool because her spaceship is just in random pieces of media as well. And oh, really? it like hasn't flown a mission yet, but it just looks so sick that anytime there's like, not anytime, but there have been multiple sci-fi movies and like we saw it in an anime once. What, what they've got Where like, they just have that design. Like literally it's like someone's going to space in her vehicle what? and we'll watch it and she's like, oh yeah, that's like the thing that I am making. Like I built what that. Hell? That wouldn't what? exist without me. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, that's really cool. Yeah, it's on my water bottle if you want to look right there, Keelan. That's what it looks like. Thing. Oh, yeah. I can't see. What actually you look sick? Yeah. I'm gonna go. Yeah, wait, I'll get it, I'll get it. Yeah, you get it. Oh, That's crazy. Oh, that, that is sick. That and doing parkour is such a fun yeah. life. That's really cool. It looks kind of almost like a killer whale. Yes, I lovingly call it the Darth Orca. Ah. <laughs> no, you I, see I don't. That's, that gets me in trouble. 
<laughs> it looks kind of almost like what you expect a slightly futuristic shuttle to look like, which is yeah, cool. Yeah, so it's, it's pretty cool. So we're building um, cargo vehicles. We've just kicked off um, building a crew vehicle, so that would transport people. Yeah. Um, so that's just started. Um, and then my company is also creating a new space station. Wow. Does it feel like you're origin. working on like the bigger picture or is it like your daily is just like, you know, tinkering with a much, much smaller thing and you kind of, you're aware of it to the bigger picture. Um, so my stuff is more like pretty good about staying, staying the bigger picture. Like there's like, you get very like down and in on, on little like pieces of it. Yeah. Um, but that's one thing that I like, I tell the people that work for me, like, I'm like, Hey, if you're somebody will be having kind of a rough day and you can tell they're just beat up. They've been stuck in this Paper, because I'm assuming when you're dealing with sensors and things, yeah. like you're just talking about millimeters and yeah, and so yeah, like they'll get like really down into this tiny little thing, and I'm just like, hey, get up, take a walk, go look at it. And oh, you can it's, you go you can go and see send it. Send them down the hall, and there's they're literally building it. That's in so our sick. And what? like get get people to kind of take a step back from their their tiny little thing. And yeah, see yeah, it. that's really cool. Because if you yeah, I guess it was in a completely different facility. It yeah, would feel a bit detached. Like, that even like the it's similar in that COVID isolation of like, mm. you just kind of forget that you're part of like a community when you're so isolated. It's the same thing at work. If you're like stuck in your little yeah. tiny bubble That's and you like forget cool. to take a step back that like, Hey, there's more to this than this like one little requirement that you're struggling with. Yeah. That's so yeah, it's cool. Sick. It's crazy. I've been doing that for nine years. Amazing. Wow. Yeah. I knew, I knew awesome. there was something to do with space. <laughs> I had no awesome. clue at all. That was such a good surprise. <laughs> do you do, like, this ruins the shot. are you ever going to get to go? <laughs> Oh gosh, no! No, I do not want to go to space. Really? Oof. I mean, it's all fake, isn't it? You're just you're part of the bigger oh, conspiracy. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, we actually met a flat earther <laughs> the other day, and uh, oh, that's, that must have been so funny for you. It was hysterical, <laughs> but like my biggest issue with the whole flat earther thing is like not that your like basis of science is like just skewed, because like fair enough, you only got your freshman year of science education, like you're just not that intelligent. I can see how you made the leap. <laughs> <laughs> But like, realistically, I could see how you made the leaps that you made. Yeah, yeah. There's some convincing YouTube documentaries, that kind of thing. But, but my real problem is, do you really think that the entirety of the space community, the entirety of NASA, all got together and sat down and said, yeah, you know what we're going to do? We're going to fool everyone. But the thing this I also love funny. is that like, all of these things, they're always like NASA, NASA, NASA. It's like, there are other countries with other space programs. <laughs> like, right? It's not all about America. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, you really, like... Yeah, the Russian space. Agency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone's Fantastic. in on it. Yeah, yeah. European yeah, everyone's space in on it. agency, the Canadian space agency, Japan. Like exactly. China had a space India. Station. I think has one. There's loads. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, should we talk about some jumps and stuff? Maybe one yeah. or two. Yeah. Um, I mean, should we do a very, very quick, like you know, rundown of of you two origins and things purely because that's, that's what be we good. typically do with with guests. Mm. Um, let's start with Max because we've done the space, so we'll go back. Yeah, New York. Yeah, New York, New York mm. baby. Do you training origin? Is that what you want to hear? Yeah, I just yes, let's please. give us a uh, yeah, let's give us a course, brief. Please. I mean, we could just Quick probably rundown. I could probably like read a, a page of this and it might tell me, but <laughs> we'll talk about that in a second. Yeah, uh, I started parkour in two thousand seven. Yep, uh, I was fourteen, and my best friend had seen David Bell on like a new special, oh, and okay. he came back like we neither of us had computers so he really wanted to show me we had to go to the public library to like rent a computer and he's like dude there's this crazy guy he's jumping off buildings it's like spider-man in real life which has a whole new connotation now with the all real in real life videos <laughs> <Gosh>. <laughs> but he couldn't remember what it was called and we had no idea what to search so we just went on youtube which was still pretty new at the time yeah. thankfully and we searched like guy jumps off building and survives <laughs> and survives. i was gonna say like you just there were two really scarring videos and then we found <laughs> david bell thankfully so it was like the third video down was en avance toujours and uh we watched that and then we watched like the urban ninja video yeah. oh, and the uh old compilation to like rise against paper wings yeah the yeah. parkour and free running compilation um and yeah then we just like went to this elementary school that was right across the street from the library. And if you've ever seen my old videos, it's in basically every single one of my videos. It just happened to be like one of those spots that good. had random challenges you could mine at every single level of difficulty. Yeah. Oh, and it was sick. just such a happy coincidence to be like, 
oh, there's stairs to jump between and then you get better and you're like, oh, actually this is a spot. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> wow. yeah. Um, yeah. And I just kind of got deeper. I got really nerdy really quickly as I do. With I think most you things. are unapologetically a, a massive parkour nerd. Right? Oh yeah. I think yeah. a good, so most people probably after they wanted to start parkour, wouldn't do this. My second move after going out and training, like within a week, you I found French. the like parkour.net <laughs> and I went and printed out in their philosophy section, like a 115 page booklet of all of the like longest threads. It was like Blaine's dilution, like Thomas Kudik's, um like stories and just like printed them out in a booklet and I'd carry it around with me to wow. training sessions. Wow. And it would have like warm up things and like nutrition and strength training and philosophy and history. And I'd just be like, all right, I'm like in between training i need a little break i'll stretch and like get my booklet out and read and Incredible. uh that was probably within a week of training <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> as like a 14 year old that was just that's my personality that's amazing um and yeah obviously like i was just super into it yeah and just kept going hard into yeah. the community and, and i mean you got very very good and i feel like you were making a name for yourself in the u.s scene and yeah, I was lucky. So, I mean, I started early relatively. Definitely and helps, I think yeah. of people who are my age, the only person I can think of that started around the same time, um, like Dylan Baker, mm. we were about, he's a year or two older than me. Yeah. And then um, Mike Arujo from New York, who yep. some people might know, and he's still training as well. Yeah, and yeah. so Mike and I were like good training partners. Uh, and then I found a couple other people my age gradually, but because I was just on the younger side, I think I got hooked up with like WFPF in the like late 2000s, early 2010s. When did you start making an effort to like get over to Europe a lot? I think after, so in 2010, I think mm, 2010 or 2011, I think it was 2010, I got invited. I was too young to do Ultimate Parkour Challenge. Uh, like okay, Phil yeah. and I were basically were the same age. Yeah. Um, he's like six months older than me and we both were too young, but they'd, we both had been in talks with them about maybe participating somehow. And then when they did, when that was canceled, they did like a little tour and invited Phil and I to come out and just train and hang out. Uh, and so I like showed up in Santa Monica and got dropped off by a taxi. And the best part is that they apparently hadn't told the athletes I was coming. So I just <laughs> knock on the door and it's like Tim Sheaf answers in and I'm house. fanboying yeah. so hard. Like, hi, I'm here to travel with you for six weeks. That's and he sick. just like turns around and walks back into the house, like doesn't say a word. And then Becky, Pip's wife, comes out and yeah. she's like, oh, hello, love. Like, how can we help you? And just is like the sweetest human being and like wow. sets me up with a spot on the couch. And so I met like Pip and Tim and Phil, um, yeah, and then once I'd met them, it was kind of just like, well, I'd like to go and visit you guys in your hometown. And yeah, yeah. I was always aware of all the videos and emulated the English style super hard in particular because I really looked up to like Callum and Phil um, as people who were my age that were at I don't know the if next I ever, level. Yeah, I don't know if I ever told you this. The first time I ever met you, which was Brooklyn Zoo, uh, I think it was pre off the edge, but I was staying with Jesse in New York and we went to the zoo. And I was like standing on a, a wall and I saw this guy like walk into the reception area and my head immediately was like, that's an English person because you were wearing green Primark joggers <laughs> and I probably, I don't know, like a cropped white t-shirt or something. And you just looked just so like, you just looked like, I don't know, like Callum Powell or something. And you were kind of like well built and you just, you had the like, the like the strong parkour body. And I was like, is that an English? I was like, oh. <laughs> that's Max Henry. I was like, there it is. Close enough. But yeah, yeah. No, that was great. No, I definitely like modeled my style pretty hard. Yeah. Uh, well, and I think really it was like Blaine. Mm. When I first saw original videos, like the OG Yamakaze videos, it was like, that's insane, but I'm terrified of heights. I don't think I can really do any of those things. And then we kept kind of scrolling through and I saw uh, Power's Nothing Without Control as yeah. like my fifth video. And seeing Blaine stick a rail precision was like a light went off in my head. I'm like, I will not ever stop this sport until I can do that like perfectly. That's oh, so nice. sick. And when I got to coach with Blaine a few years ago, it was like I had the biggest fanboy moment of my life. Yeah. So I was coaching with Blaine and Jan Hunatra. <laughs> and Blaine was like, you know, man, like your rail precision's like 
your technique. Like, I want your technique. And I was like, I want, no, you're the one that like made me want to do this. And then Jan was like, yeah, like when we started parkour with Yamakaze, we saw people jumping sideways to rails, stride sideways, stride on poles. This not possible. And it was like the coolest moment of yeah. my training career to just oh. have two people who are like massive, massive role That's models. It's so nice that like the sport's young enough that people can have those connections. Like they mm. can be inspired and then level up to that point. Yeah. And how cool that the people who did it don't have the egos that get in the way and are able to be like, thank you for also contributing to yeah, this thing yeah. I love, you know? Yeah. That's so nice. nice. That's like shout out to, yeah, Blaine, just the nicest dude as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is this is a whole thing in itself, but we should just touch on it briefly because you wrote a book. I did. The Parkour Roadmap, which Max, he signed it today. <laughs> oh, he he yes. wrote a little note for me. Yeah, I, sh I should have written you a roses or red poem, but I thought of it a bit too late. Um, do you want to just give a quick run through of this? I think it like the reason probably is like the most interesting thing the um if, if you want a hard copy i'm sorry because there actually aren't any available anywhere which is awesome yeah but they're basically only being resold right now um the reason i wrote it was when i started i didn't really have a community mm. around me i was like just far enough outside of new york city that i didn't train with people more than like once a month and so that's pretty crazy actually. yeah and so i just got like all of my training information from the internet and i think that's why my style isn't like stereotypically american especially back then it was like i trained functionally more with like you and antoine dutille and phil and yeah, all these from people your online influence from videos than i did with people and i wanted to capture like some of that history and put it in one place where people who wanted to get into the sport now like you can't dig through the dot net forums you no. can't you, you can't like there's no archive of all of these influential videos and posts etc so for me the point of the parkour roadmap wasn't necessarily like let's make a you know let's make tutorials or make people better athletes it was like let's throw all this information into one place yeah and let people discover it for themselves and that's why i called it the roadmaps i'm like i'd never like some of the reviews that we get uh, that i've gotten on amazon are funny and people are like you know, three out of five, like doesn't really teach you that much parkour. And <laughs> I'm actually really stoked to hear that as a review because I mm. didn't want to waste space doing something someone else had done better on a video. Yeah, yeah. So for me, the whole point was like, what can I give people? Basically just my encyclopedic nerdy knowledge of the parkour community and culture and compile it into one place. The thing I really liked about it, like the thing that I was, when I read it, I mean, it was a couple of years ago that I went through it, but... um it felt very it felt like the type of thing that i could give to someone like my dad for example who like was supportive of me at the start of my training and was very interested in parkour but now like is completely detached from it and he doesn't know much apart from what he sees here but it's like it's just the right level of depth that if he wants to dive in further i mean basically the reason i haven't given it to him is because he can't read a book without falling asleep now but uh <laughs> he's a very sleepy man no, he, he's, he just, we will fall asleep reading anything. But um, he, it's it's like, there's all the information there, but you can dive in because you've like done a lot of linking and things. It's like, you give those resources to be like, oh, I want to go and explore this topic more and stuff. And it's, I really enjoyed yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, so. my, my, we started probably, you were like 12. How 13, old were you? yeah. 13, and I just turned 14. Yeah. And it was the same, like when my parents dropped me off at my first jam. Yeah. They were like, what's this thing you want to do? I showed them a video and they're like, God, you want to do that? <laughs> my dad, we used to come to this station around the corner and my dad used to fucking take me up to London and like just stand there while I just train with all yeah. these like 19 year olds who were kind of people like Luke Markey and like tattooed kind yeah. of people. And like, he was just like, okay. <laughs> and wow. like a cowboy hat. Yeah, yeah. and like stuff like that and blue, who's just all blue. Yeah, <laughs> like, it's crazy. Yeah, it was yeah. the same. It was like 14. My dad's like, how'd you meet these guys? I'm like, well, I met them on online. <laughs> also the youngest one is like, there's one 16 year old and then it's like a bunch of 20 and 30 year old yeah, men that I yeah. met on the internet. And he's like, yeah, we're going to take you to these events for sure. <laughs> wow. And that was like one of my goals with it as well is to have something that you like, you got it at Vinnie Coriel's gym. Yeah. I wanted to make something that like parents Could. sitting in the lobby at a gym, it's like, what are, what's my kid actually doing beyond yeah. just, you know, running courses in a class or something. Well, that's the thing mm -hmm. I've, I've, you've, I've probably said it on this a number of times on the podcast, but like gyms, I feel like need to do more to build that like culture or like resource of culture within the 
the, the reception environment because it is it's like that's where you're getting some of these parents are dropping their kids off for a birthday party and they might just think parkour is just some random activity and it's like if they can see that there's sort of yeah like literature brands media and things like this they're like oh there's it's bigger than just this one environment like mm-hmm. here um but no it's sick it's but, sick um, that you were carrying that thing you printed out and then it turned into now <laughs> yeah, you've got yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do you know what i mean like maybe there's some people who carry that around like yeah. while they're training like, oh, read it again or something yeah it's that's really cool that's really cool and i mean another goal with that one too is like I think accessibility in parkour, it's really easy for us to like put our horse blinders on and only look at the parkour community in North America and Europe and Mm. maybe a couple other choice countries. But Mm. my big goal with this, like it's expensive to buy it. So what I wanted to do is to do it online yeah, and then make an option where athletes from countries that don't have a currency that holds up well against the US dollar could just download it for free or like donate to what they could. And I got so many really, really sweet messages from practitioners in like India and the Middle East and South America. And they're like, thank you for making this because it's already in a language that is not my first language. And it would have cost me like a week of work to buy this. And I think that's like another thing that I hope to see more of. And I think people are doing a lot more of that as well, but it's like making information accessible Mm. And even just like noticing where it's not accessible and where that breakdown happens is uh, it's definitely difficult. It, I, I'm 100% there's like a, a culture at the moment of online, like, I mean, the, the roadmap that online creators seem to sort of do is you build up an audience and then like monetize it. You, you, you drip feed enough information to get people interested and then you go, here's the course, here's the book or whatever. Whereas, yeah, it's doing, doing kind of what you did is almost like the, not the opposite of that, but it's it's keeping the accessibility there. Yeah. Mm. I mean, the great thing about parkour in that case too is that enough people bought it that it was like a pay it forward situation mm. where if you price, like I was able to price it at a place where like, yeah, maybe if you're like a student in the US or North America or like Europe, it might be a bit expensive for you. But by you purchasing it now, it gives me the opportunity to release it for free to people who literally couldn't get it any yeah, other way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's just a nice model to have for information that doesn't, it doesn't cost me anything to replicate it, right? So yeah, it's like, exactly. try and make it accessible. Yeah. yeah. Sick. Uh, more spaceships. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually just found the booklet at his parents' house. Like, oh, really? Like a year or two ago. Oh, the, the, the booklet. booklet. The booklet exists. Holy like, grail. <laughs> that's sick don't break it it is yeah. as nerdy as you would expect is it yeah. ba- what's it bound <laughs> together more, with yeah. staples is it annotated yeah. and like is it like and like critique I think it's like, highlighted, highlighted it. really amazing yeah. that's oh, it's so good it's, it's adorable I think the most adorable part is that your parents kept it they probably didn't <laughs> notice it <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> amazing sick um mm. so where are you initially from ooh I grew up in Missouri St. Louis Missouri Okay. Is that Which is, Missouri? I need Missouri to is my job it's is dead so in the middle of the United States. Mm. Um, so the United States has like one major river that runs down north to south, and then one major river that kind of cuts diagonally. Mm. And I'm from where they meet. Oh really? Sick. <laughs> oh really? Sick. I just went on maps and I just typed in America. <laughs> <laughs> oh my Wi-Fi is off. Hold up. <laughs> Well, because then just, I can look at it, it from just give you a <laughs> meme yeah. of an eagle. No, 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 it gave me that. <laughs> yeah, freedom. So. Colorado, Nebraska, Montana. That way. That way. Oh, okay. That's more easterly than I thought. No, that's pretty central. Yeah, it's pretty pretty dead centered. Yeah, okay. Um, so I was born there. I lived there for 18 years. And then I went to university in Colorado. Ah, um, uh, okay. So I went. I, was that after you found parkour? Before. Before, okay, oh. okay, okay. Um, yeah, so I did gymnastics growing up. As you as you do, um, and then graduated from high school. Wanted to get the heck out of Missouri, and I'd always wanted to go to Colorado, and I'd never really been there. I think I'd been there for like twenty four hours, mm. um, and I'd always wanted to go. So I applied to a university there, and I got in, and then I went to Colorado. And nice. So you had no idea what you were getting yourself into. Really didn't know what I was getting myself into. I think the one day I was there, it was like terribly cold. It was snowing. It was. Wow. Um, Wait, so you went to Colorado to study engineering? I went to Colorado to get out of Missouri. 
Oh wow! And then I also studied engineering. <laughs> but but you you went to do an engineering course. No, I just went to go to university. You just you just and went then to I university. Engineering once I got there. Wow! Were so, you already into that sort of stuff, or was it? So is that kind I mean, of just yes. a, oh, it's um, kind of interesting. So I I've always liked building stuff. Um, I'm also a nerd. Um, I, I got on the robotics team. I built model rockets. I love like, that you guys uh, have like robotics teams in America. I feel like we don't yeah. have that in England. Um, like, I took absolutely yeah. every science course that my school had. Um, like I think I would, joked that I could have graduated like eight times over in science specifically because there was really not a science requirement. I think you had to take like two semesters of science. Wow. And I took yeah, everything. Crazy. as much as you could possibly take. Um, and so I was like, okay, well this seems and so I was applying for or signing up for classes and they're like, yeah, somebody like hallway talk said, well, if you don't start in engineering, you can't graduate in four years. And I was like, well, I can't graduate in five years. I don't have money for five years. I only have money for four years. Like I, my scholarships were only for four years. So I was like, I guess I have to start in engineering if I think I'm going to do engineering. Yeah. Um, and so I did. And then now you build spaceship. Now I build spaceships. That's amazing that like you getting out of Missouri and just ending up in Colorado has just basically been a monumental like pivot for your life yeah Wild, because it's right? like career no, relationship parkour ever like and i'm assuming wow. now a huge amount of your friendship group is parkour etc etc like yeah no i think about that all the time because i especially like the culture of the of the adult in where i grew up is like you you go to work you come home you watch television you go to bed you get up the next day like, yeah yeah and that's like you don't there's not a, there's not athletics for adults where yeah. i grew up really it's just like your kids kids do sports yeah but adults watch sports mm. wow and watch their kids do sports and then it's like and so i i like very frequently think like i would be this like very yeah. unhealthy very like just netflix person yeah, yeah. netflix person <laughs> if i if i would have stayed there and when I like moving to Colorado, like, yeah, I, the way I got into parkour is I'd, I'd heard about, it, I knew about it really. Cause most people moved to Colorado, most people get into parkour and then they moved to Colorado. Yeah. Oh, so I actually, the very first person I ever saw do parkour was Kyle Epic Mendoza. Oh, amazing. So he's, ah, I don't know who this person is. Uh, it's an old, it's a deep cut. Um, he, um, he, he invented the term stay positive. <laughs> Did he? Yeah, you, you have never uttered those words before, ever. Stay positive. Yeah, are you vlogging something very? So at the end of his videos, right, he used to be like, "Stay positive," and he then put up a video once where he got really annoyed because he like saw somebody else saying the word "stay positive," and it was really weird. Do you remember it? Yeah, it was a, bit, a very. He was very upset, and he was like, he was basically claiming that he'd kind of like it was his turn. He like competed in Art of Motion Tampa. And he did a bunch of tutorials and stuff as well. But yeah. he's like one of the older uh, US practitioners. And mm. he's still training, which is cool. Mm. So I think he took a break and then came back to it. Uh, yeah, he had some facial hair. He had like long black hair Kind of youtuber well. like early youtuber -y. He looked yeah, like he could be course. like a really, really like powerful yoga teacher. Oh, really? yeah. Yeah. He yeah. had that vibe. <laughs> was he APK? Uh, I don't know if he was an APK. Uh, he was yeah. on WFPF for a time yeah. as well, yeah. Anyway, sorry. So yeah, so I, the first time I ever saw parkour, I was I was a gymnast. I was take I like needed an extra session on on bar work. Like I was not good at not good at bars. And Were you com like competing gymnastics? Yeah, I was, yeah. and I went into a, an open gym session at another gym just to like go work on stuff outside of like my my team's comp uh, team's practices. And there were some people on the floor like doing these just like big dives to blocks. And I was it's like- Epic shit. It was, it was very cool. Like, or I guess they, they looked like they were having a great time. Yeah, That's, yeah. But I, that was pretty much the, what I gave to it. I was just like, huh. And then I kept, was doing my thing. I was like, oh, yeah, cool. They're doing a thing. I, and I kind of never really thought about it again until then I was in college and a friend of mine, his name's Willie Douglas. He was like, Hey, you did gymnastics. Like, could you do a backflip? I was like, well, yeah, probably I could still do a backflip. I, and he's like, oh, you should come with me to this place. And now, granted, as a female, if some male comes up to you and says, come with me to this place, place. maybe like, ask oh, more questions. Yeah. Beyond <laughs> this place. <laughs> this place. Um, but I didn't because this because we were friends. But anyway, um, 
<laughs> and that's anyway. Um, and so he actually took me to the original Apex Denver that was in downtown next to the like homeless shelter wow. and it's in a really sketchy it was, oh, at the time it was a very sketchy you roll area. up up to the homeless shelter you're like what's going on and went, with a, <laughs> went with a couple friends and met um will what's his last name schultz. will schultz was there like and i think i tried to do like a wall flip like that was cool and then i didn't think about it again for a year so I've had like multiple interviews. Oh, you went really? back, like a gym session, a and then just left it for a year. Left it for a year. Wow. The gym shut down. They opened a new gym. So they're like the At least you got bug. To see that place. <laughs> the bug yeah. didn't like bite you. Like you weren't like oh. yes. Yeah. Oh, even worse. It gets worse. <laughs> <laughs> You've actively tried to avoid parkour. <laughs> so then I like, they opened their new gym, and so they started like a club at the university of like, like Charles St. John was if you've ever met him he ran a parkour club for the university of denver and i was like oh cool like i like doing flips this seems like an outlet for me to do flips yeah they have a spring floor like cool i'm, I'm just gonna go and i pretty much only went for the spring floor and because i really needed friends and so i did that for like several years and they're like hey do you and then i think it was in like 2013 i finally was like oh i actually want to do this thing yeah mm -hmm. yeah um and so i i got my i like did an internship in san san diego and i had to like actively that was the first time i had to actively search out anyone doing parkour wow, um yeah. because i'd been basically just like born into a parkour a high level parkour culture yeah mm -hmm. um with, just with unintentionally and you yeah. just didn't realize yeah and so then i started did this internship, trained with that local community. I was like, man, I actually think I want to be good at this. And then I came back and like, actually really got interested and wanted to get better. And I learned how to do the vaults and I learned how to Kong, like I learned yeah. everything. And then I became a, got certified through Apex. I started teaching with them, taught with them for a couple of years. That's so sick. Actually like got interested, like wanted to compete. Did NAPC. Yeah, because so you, how many times have you competed? Uh, a lot. Yeah, but like uh, NAPC and stuff. NAPC like. I've done twice. Because yeah, I feel, I basically I feel, what I was sort of going to say is I feel like there was a, because only because last night you kind of said like, I don't want to be a professional athlete kind of thing. Yeah. And just, I can't remember what conversation we're talking about, but like there was obviously, a, was there a stage when you were pursuing it more in that sense, or was it has it always just been a? Um, so I did. I I kind of wanted like the the cake and eat it too. Yeah. Like okay. I I wanted to. I've I've always been too much of a long game type of person. Like I'm, and so the the instant gratification of like oh I'm going to be a professional athlete and I'm going to have this thing, I've always like part of me has always wanted that and I've always been like oh like am I going to regret the fact that I didn't just like quit my job and go full all in. But then the other side of me is like, yeah, but if you keep doing this engineering thing that you do love, that you do equally like invest as much in as you like love parkour. And it probably pays and it significantly pays more. So much better. And <laughs> you can still do both as well, which is yeah. great. And I think that's where I was like, okay, I'm doing both. And for a while I tried to do both at a very high level. And it's, and then I kind of got to this point where parkour was not going to be a career. And if I wanted to still enjoy it, I had to not be killing myself over it. Yeah. Mm. Um, and so I kind of, I got very injured. Um, and so now I've been, it's the, the joke is that I'm operating on like bonus time. Like parkour <laughs> beat me. It fully kicked me in the teeth. So was the injury, because I want to touch on this. So you you basically savaged yourself at for the love movement, right? I did. In the and I, was, I was yeah. How you, how I did think. it happen? Was it did was you, I with you? Oh, your knee or your leg? I don't know. You weren't. No, you were in. You were in Michigan. You were in Michigan. Oh yeah, no, we just started dating, and I was like, wow, I'm dating a girl that does parkour. This is so <laughs> cool. She's that for the love, and then I just get like a text of her with a picture like high as heck in the hospital, <laughs> and I'm like, what? Well, what has just happened yeah. in Europe? Was this jump fest? I think we were at Jump Fest. I yeah, think it, it, we it either, I think it just happened or something. Because I remember like being around you and asking about it. Yeah, because you you yeah that was twisted it in the sand, right? I want to yeah. hear about yeah. this. Yeah. So I was I was there with um, Renee Dombley, and um, we were kind of doing a Europe like travel together, and like I we were just all kind of doing flips off this ledge, and um, I was like, oh, like that'd be a good spot to 
do a rise full. And I was like very, very consistently like, I was very comfortable with with not landing it perfectly. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. Very comfortable. So I was like, oh, this is a great spot to like actually drill this. And I I did one or two and then I handed Renee my phone and I was like, hey, like this, these feel really good. Like, will you film the next one? And this poor girl, like I hand her my phone. <laughs> I was like, will you film the next one? And then I land and go, my foot kind of like sinks in, but I like basically just like go to like butt roll, like, you know, when you just over rotate a flip yeah. and you just like yeah. roll, roll out backwards and my foot didn't move. And so it just basically like sunk in and stuck. And so when oh. I went to turn to like roll over my shoulder, Ew. my foot just went, <laughs> ever sounded like breaking spaghetti. Really? Yeah, oh. I can't, to this day. That's fucked. Uh, she hates when I do that. I, um, <laughs> I just remember that event and just hearing the general thing. I mean, I feel like movement is amazing. That was and a great done, event. And it was just like, yeah, there was sand. Everyone got injured. It yeah. was, it was just, I, I think so, it was were you there for that? that? I, I don't know whether I was there when you did that. Maybe I was. Uh, I think they've three, had sand a few times now. Yeah, and there were three people that broke broke ankles in that. Yeah, yeah. Not, it was, it was just safe. bad, it was a bad. Also, the, the setup gets so sandy anyway. Yeah. So yeah. it's really hard to use. But yeah, it was, a, it was a great event. Everyone was very sweet. Um, everyone was so sweet to me the whole time. Um, but yeah, and I, I basically like, I looked up and I looked at Renee and I was like, well, that just broke. And she's <laughs> wow. just, and she's like, what? And I was like, my ankle just broke. And she's like, medic, wow. <laughs> need a medic. And it was, she's a sweetheart. If you ever get severely injured anywhere, Do it with she's Renee. a great person. <laughs> she, she will go above and beyond. And was that like a bit of a, not nail in the coffin, but like a dampener for your kind of the mindset of being like, I want to. I think I was already on the way out. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think I was already like, Hey, there, there's people that want this way more than I do. And I'm not willing to like, I don't, I don't need that kind of stress. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think I was already on the, on the way of way out of it. And that was definitely the like, F this sport. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I definitely had like a pretty long period of just being like, it's cool if I never do this again, it's fine. How long were you out for? Like f completely out, like physically? Um, I think I was, I didn't, I was on crutches for six months. Jesus Christ. What did and you do? What did you actually do to your, was and it so not I, just broke? Everything. Not just broke. Was it like ligaments and things? So she doesn't have ligaments. <laughs> not anymore. Not no. anymore. Um, they actually didn't know if they the ligaments all tore during it or if they were already not there. Um, they really couldn't tell. Um, but I basically just broke my fib. But the way they had to set it, they like screwed into the bones to like line the bones back up, and then had to screw a plate to those, and then screw that to my tib. And so Ooh. there's like 11 screws and a plate. Holding still in there? Them. Yeah, still in there. Wow. Um, and I've contemplated like getting them out, but it's, I don't, in my head, my bone looks like Swiss cheese if you take them out. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It stresses yeah. me out. Um, but yeah, so that, that kind of mentally was just a checkout yeah. point. But then now it feels like bonus time. Like it feels mm. like everything from here on out is like, I just like freebie. Yeah. You know? But like you extras. seem like, I mean, you seem just sort of speaking to you these last couple of days, you seem happy with kind of the balance you have going on. I mean, it's not like I have to ask you in depth about it, but like you've got a stable job that you clearly enjoy and you're still incredibly connected to this community. You're working on bigger projects, which we'll talk about in a minute. And it's like, at the, I think the more time goes on and the more some of us like older folk go on like i'm one of these stubborn people who's like i'm still in four core <laughs> like <laughs> life is trying to like you know pull in some stable money giles and things like this but other people are like no it's cool like parkour is going to always be there and i'm going to still do it but like i'm going to also do an extra job on the side and things yeah. and like i mean i think I, I i mean i talk about this a lot i think parkour itself like does a disservice that like you have to stay oh if you're not purely parkour you're not giving you're not on the grind you're not yeah, doing yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. you're a sellout i'm like that's such a that's such a short-sighted view like and because it's parkour so is a, hard to do well and like, also and parkour it's... is so much bigger than that if we really want this sport to be bigger and be like mainstream and be a thing that isn't just a bunch of elite level hoodlums <laughs> like we need to realize that like the casual person who does parkour is their after work activity, yeah. Yeah, their yeah. after work athletic that they go to the parkour In the gym. same way the average mm -hmm. person who skateboards or whatever yeah. is like, they're not a yeah. professional, yeah, they yeah. just but skate. They go skateboard or like yeah. go play a pickup game of basketball in the 
park after like those well, people that's still like a valuable thing and tons of people play basketball not everyone plays in the nba mm. yeah what is pickup basketball i always hear that oh uh, you just get a bunch of friends and you go play oh okay it's i didn't pick, know if like it was you a... pick up game like it's not planned yeah, yeah, okay, yeah you yeah. just kind of show up at the park and i didn't know it. if it was like you know touch rugby where it's like rugby just different non-contact yeah. yeah oh yeah, yeah. No. did your do you feel like your mindset changed or like not mindset but how you enjoy parkour absolutely yeah mm. yeah i i think that i just it's so <laughs> i think it's almost frustrating for people around me sometimes <laughs> because i just i'm joking that i'm like i'll do the 80 percent mm. i'll like 80 percent of a challenge just be like eh, that's okay <laughs> Not, not today. Uh, tomorrow never happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but even still, like, I mean. But I think it's. The 80% still progression. Yeah, yeah, and it's. Like you were sprinting on rails yesterday. It's not like oh, you those were. Those were great rails. Yeah. They were perfect. <laughs> so. But no, that's so. that There's yeah, so the much less pressure. Better. Yeah, and it's. I I was for a long time training to compete. Mm -hmm. Like training to be a freestyle athlete and training to stay leveled up with other people. Mm. And when I was really injured, I read a lot of sports psychology. I read a lot of mindset and type type books. And it was very like, if you're always trying to compete with somebody else, you're- You're never happy. You're, well, you're never happy, but also like, you're trying to be better than their best. That's never gonna mm. be your best. Mm. So now you've, you've basically set yourself a new bar where like maybe you could have actually gotten to here, but because you were trying to be as good as this person who's only here, you're only ever gonna get to here. And yeah. I was like, oh, that's kind of uh, an interesting yeah. concept. And I, mm. I kind of took that and was like, I don't need to compete with these people and I don't need to be better than anybody. Like, sure, everyone's competitive. Like nobody walks into a competition and is like, oh, I'm just here to have fun. Like bullshit, you're, you're, you're here because you want to play. Yeah, like, there's always that. Yeah. It's win. a big game. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, it's fun as well. Like, <laughs> but, it's fun but at the that. same time, I think like that voice is so much smaller than it used to be. Yeah. Which is so much healthier. Mm. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, more people need to hear that definitely. Like for sure, saying, for, for it sure. To be mainstream and stuff, not everyone needs to take it really serious. Yeah. yeah. But you can as well. That's the yeah. brilliant thing yeah. about it. Um, I want to, we obviously want to get onto Queen City, but mm. just to sort of segue back to Max and then I guess onto that, your, I mean, your like career path has been, you were obviously coaching a huge amount. You were living in a van for a while and like driving around and coaching and things. You're now a fucking expert barista by the taste of the, uh, <laughs> the coffee. But what, what's your, where are you taking it? And then I guess we can segue this into like point yeah. A and everything totally um yeah so i lived in a van pretty much for three years yeah uh coaching did you meet him when he was in van life she did meet me in smelly van oh. life you maybe don't go too deep into this Actually, <laughs> no i feel like we must we met before van life or were you in the van when we met the first okay so the funny story oh, about wait, us can we, meeting can, yeah can we do this like yeah okay where so did you two meet we met we started talking really it was just like over Instagram, yeah. But, but we'd always known each other because I knew you from the Hyper Team Swag Force <laughs> Snapchat like, group. So I would like went to Missoula when I was in the van and hung out with Kent Johns and like Nate was there at the time and, and a bunch of those guys. Yeah. And they added me to this Snapchat group with like Davis Vasconcelos and a bunch of other of the like younger American community. And Christine was like the only other person on there that was my age that I didn't know. <laughs> I'm like, who is this random woman that's like on a Snapchat group with a bunch of so you 19 met year olds? Snapchat. Well, no, because I was I was like, yeah, she's cool. And then I found out about her job. I was like, that's really cool. <laughs> and then as we started talking more, I was like, she's pretty cool. And I was reading this really like big fantasy book and I'd posted it on Instagram and she hit me up and was like, I'm also reading that. And I'm like, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't get better than this. Like, it's like you, you build spaceships, you do parkour. We have the same friends and you're reading the same nerdy fantasy book. That is, like, come yeah, on. Way too like, yeah, yeah, no. Um, but we'd apparently met for the first time at NAPC and we both stayed at Alyssa Serpa's house and neither oh, yeah, of us remember it. I heard this yesterday. <laughs> That's so funny. So we both were like had gone to NAPC and needed a place to crash and we like, she slept on the couch and I slept on the floor and we were like, that didn't happen. I don't know what you're talking about. And she's like, yeah, it did. And like had evidence like, oh, 
I guess we like stayed in the same apartment for three days and somehow just don't remember. Wow. Maybe you were just both really shy and you were like, just don't keep I was I was in training mode. I keep like, myself no. to myself. Yeah. yeah, I needed to focus. Yeah. But um, I think my career path was like, I got really lucky, probably in a similar way to like wh- how you maybe felt when you started with Modus, mm-hmm. where I had a sketchy old man come in and promise me money <laughs> as an athlete. And I was like, yeah, so let's do that. Uh, and I worked with WFPF for like a decade and had a lot of really good times. And, um, but also saw like, okay, they're kind of going in this direction of like coaching certifications and competition, et cetera, et cetera. And I had zero desire to get into that. Um, so when I kind of left WFPF and went in my own direction, I was really getting into like rock climbing in that community and culture. Mm-hmm. And it was right around the time, like before van life was popping, but it was when like, if you were into climbing, the all the best climbers were like starting to live in their vans. I remember when we were at Santorini together, you were raving about Alex Honnold and uh, yeah. he just released, um, was it Alone on the Wall? Alone on the Wall? I think it was probably around when Alone on the Wall. Oh, I haven't seen that one. No, Alone on the Wall is the Honnold one that was on that. Uh, oh, pre- it was the, the book, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you were, I remember you talking about like the sort of the van life and things like that back then. Yeah. It's crazy so, how it's popped now. Yeah. Like, yeah. Really popped. Yeah. And so I just like bought, I'd done a big job for American Eagle and I had like the most money I'd ever had. So yeah, I'm like, well, because you were in Times to... Square. Yeah. 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 That was really cool. What was this? Uh, I did like a jean advert for American Eagle with like blue, was in it. Was blue wow. and Gaetan Bouillet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I was the most American looking person they could find. So they just gave me the <laughs> job somehow. Um, but it was awesome. And it was like, cool. I have more just like spare cash lying around. I just graduated uni like a year or two before I'd been coaching uh, full time. But I was like, well, if I want to try and do the athlete thing, yeah, now's the time to do it. So I bought a van. And I managed to like for a few years, basically like pay for myself indefinitely. Like I would travel for a month and then I just pick a spot and hit up one or two gyms in that area. And just, yeah. And it would make me like four or $500 per gym. And that would pay for all my expenses for the month. Yeah. So I would just nice. be living, like we actually looked at my tax records and they were like one of the years I think I made recorded like four thousand two hundred dollars nice. for the entire year and i probably made another like three thousand dollars and just lived on that so yeah, i was like yeah. six hundred dollars a month maybe i was living on nice. um and just eating like lentils out of a can and like just but, a savage but it was awesome yeah i was yeah, gonna yeah. say did it, yeah. feel, it didn't really feel like struggle surely if it was that fun no it was it was great and my like level progressed really really hard because you're just out training every day and every day like there were days like I woke up, I'd been in Miami <clears throat> and I was hanging out with some friends and I was like, you know, I'm kind of tired of this spot. Like I want to go somewhere different. And then like an hour later, I'm like, yeah, it would be cool to like hang out in LA for a month. And I just like packed my van and drove to LA that's like that so, day. Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah, it'd be cool so to go to LA. Sick. Boom. Wow. Like done. Yeah. So sick. And I called up some of like my friends that were gym owners along the way and I'm like, Hey, you're in Texas. I'll be there in like I could be there in a week and we can schedule something and, and that like would you pay would... for the gas to get to the next spot and yeah, food, yeah. you know? Sick. And I wish got... more of that was documented or is it? No, I didn't. I didn't Cause really that's such a cool story. Yeah. Like yeah. I feel like not many people in parkour actually have done that. Yeah. You'd it think was... more people would have, but it was really cool. But I think by the end of it, I'd also realized like the limitations of that lifestyle. Mm. And it was definitely like a young man's game. And when we started talking, I was kind of like, well, Come back to my smelly van. I'm in like my late 20s. I guess I was like 26 at the time. (laughs) (laughs) And I knew kind of I could keep doing that, but I didn't see where that would go. Yeah. Mm. And I think the other thing that I learned just from being in parkour for so long is hearing people promise like five more years and the community is just going to take off and like it's financially going to skyrocket mm-hmm. and Shush not because i'm still keeping that going here just <laughs> it, you know here's the thing it can <laughs> but i think that people like for a long time people would just say that yeah and bank on it just somehow magically happening and not realize they were the ones in the position to create that growth wait mm-hmm. you were talking about the gym in colorado or whatever that promised like crazy salaries and things it's yeah like, there's just yeah. been a lot of like those situations of people who see the market potential Mm-hmm. and then don't um, figure out how to tap Actually into it, it right? Happen, yeah. And I had seen that happen like for years and years and years. And with WFPF, it was like, 
you know, contracted, like you're going to make this much a year. And I never did. And it was like, cool, that's fine. You guys are trying, but what am I going to do when I'm 35? Yeah. You know? And I, it never really like hurt my morale with training or like made me, I've never fallen out of love with parkour. Like it's been 15 years yeah. and literally like I love it as much as I did the first day that I found out about it. That's and I've so never sick. had a day where I was like, I, you have rest days, yeah, but I've never had like a day where I'm like, I hate parkour. Like I don't want to do it. It's just like every day I'm so excited to train and like engage with the community. And when I moved to Denver, it was like, cool. I've learned everything I could from, the parkour vagabond life. Yep. Like I did that. I spent all the time alone and, you know, had those experiences and now I want to learn from different experiences. And like, I'd never worked a regular job. I'd always like coached parkour or mm. done something in that. So I'm like, I want to get like a just non parkour job, see what I can learn from that. I found coffee and I was like, this is really fun. I really love engaging with people behind the counter and roasting, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then when COVID hit, it kind of was like the lifeline that I'd had to parkour severed mm. because for me, the like trips were the thing that kept my day-to-day -day life in the context of like my passion. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it was like, well, I can't even engage with the people who do the thing I love to do in my city, let alone like all of my best friends all over the world that I haven't seen in ages. Yeah. And after a year of that, and not really having any engagement with the parkour community. I think we kind of like, I came into 2021 really just feeling like beaten down mm -hmm. and being like, w I need to get, I need to figure out a way to recontextualize my relationship, like with how I want to engage with parkour and find a healthier way to integrate it into my life moving forward. That isn't just like being an athlete yeah. or being a coach, because I knew for me, like, coaching full-time I tried it and it was really draining yeah and I love to coach but it's like for me my my peak coaching is like doing you know a weekend of coaching or doing a workshop and I give 200% of my energy to that event and then I'm just drained yeah mm. and when it's like every day it's just your, the I don't have steps, the yeah. yeah I don't have the stamina and the yeah. personality to do that uh, and then that was like really when I started thinking about point a and figuring out it was an idea I'd had for like five or six years. And that was like really when I started being like, okay, 2021, Let's I feel distant from the parkour community, but it's like start making moves to push that into reality. <laughs> and so what is, what would you, what is point A for yeah. the listeners? Yeah. So point A is the, the title, the working name of, functionally right now a production company yeah uh the goal 4.a is to tell stories in parkour via video yeah one of my big inspirations was like with the book right that was kind of for me how do i get people engaged in parkour that aren't in it already how do i share information that's otherwise inaccessible or stories that are inaccessible because they're hidden behind these firewalls of forums or people and point A kind of was just a continuation of that in yeah. my head. It was like, okay, I've done it through text, but in parkour, the visual medium is so much more appealing to most people. Yeah. So how do I engage with that? And for me, the intimidating thing is like, I'm not a Giles. I'm not a cinematographer. <laughs> I don't have the experience behind the camera. So it was like, cool, if I want to make this happen, how can I now tap into all the amazing people I've met that have those skills yeah, 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 and bring them together and then like create a communal base that's providing work for all of these people within parkour to come together and put their creative energy into something that isn't like just building a brand. It's yeah. like point A is not a brand. It's a space that exists to tell stories about other people. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. It's really sick. That's so cool. Um, I just want to say, I, as we go into this project and point A and everything, I've got no idea like what the dynamic is, who's involved where and things. So if I ask a question that you can answer better than it, if I'll I'm just asking, push it, the mic yeah, if I'm it. asking it to Max or whatever, then don't, mm -hmm. yeah, because I I don't know kind of where people come in. But yeah, so it, it's it was your concept, but I guess that's a question: is you two were obviously together and married at this stage. So like, what has been your involvement in things and and also going forward with point A? I'm not involved at all. You're not involved at all. Okay, um, sick. Well, that, that, yeah. 
So so point A, I'm I'm the support. I'm the supporter. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, but no, point A is very much uh, Max's thing. Yeah. Um, and so he he kind of come up with so specifically to like Queen City, we'd kind of he'd floated this idea, and he'd been floating it for a couple of years. And originally we were saying like, oh, this we wanted to bring together. He wanted to bring together a just like no one has ever told the story of bringing together a bunch of female athletes just to train. Yeah. Um, Because when you bring a female athlete up to something, they're expected to generally pay their own way to get there, or they are here to be on a workshop, or they're here to be the token female, Mm. or yada, yada, yada. They have to compete, or they have to do, they have to do a thing. And no one has ever, and people have flown athletes to spaces to train, but it's never been primarily, this never happened for women. Yeah. and so he, he'd he been floating this idea by me before we even started dating, I think he already had it in his head of doing this type of a project. And originally we were floating doing the project in somewhere in Europe, um, probably Madrid was, I think was where Madrid or Lisbon was kind of where we were, where we were thinking. Um, and then COVID made that super not possible. So we're like, all right, what's, what's realistic? And he was like, okay, well, let's maybe North America. Yeah. Because we, we could guarantee we could get Americans together. Yeah. Um, and then we could have a couple stretch goals of getting some Canadians. And so we brought um, kind of with myself and with Kira and, and Max and Brandon, we kind of came up with a list of list of athletes. And um, so we brought in some some ones that nobody's ever heard of. We brought in some young, some old, like. Yeah. So, I mean, what what is, well, I, you mentioned Denver and obviously in, I, I don't know is Denver called well, actually just to clarify to anyone listening. So what we're talking about is a, is a film that is coming out in the next couple of months. Yeah. I, I guess I didn't that <laughs> no, it's fine. It's, it's some, it's hard. Cause it's sometimes you just, you, yeah. the conversation doesn't flow in the same way that you would intro a topic. Does it? As um, you know, post-production is yeah. always uh, where a lot of time gets lost Yeah, and parkour has a habit of, setting dates and then exceeding them by a significant margin. So what I've always wanted to do with this project, we shot it last August. Yeah. And um, just because we we're also both working full-time jobs, I was like, I'm not going to put a release date on it until it's 90 to 95% finished. And basically right now we're just waiting for like music clearances and then color and sound. Sick. So we're very, very close. Um, again, though, the music stuff, it's like, I have to wait on things. I don't know the exact time. So July is my goal. And I think that's like very, I think like July 1st to 10th range is like super, super realistic and we will have our end done by then. Yeah. It just depends on, on that kind of stuff. And so Queen City is a documentary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, again, like kind of to go back to the van time when I was nerding out about other sports and stuff, I got really into climbing and surf films. Yeah. Mm. And that style of like narrative nonfiction was super fascinating. So Queen City is our first exploration into that space. It's uh, like semi doc, semi like narrative nonfiction action film. Um, right now we're at about 45 minutes and it just tells the story of what Christine said. We got eight amazing athletes to Denver and we wanted to show what the process was of them getting to know each other, getting to explore spots together, getting to create that um, community vibe where you and a team are just like pushing yourselves in new ways and like learning really fun new things about each other. And doing it with like some people who are complete strangers and just yeah. bringing them together. Cause that's a thing that everyone in parkour understands. But yeah. again, if you're a mom and you take your kid to parkour class, my goal was like, is this something that if I was 14, I would be able to show my parents that would represent parkour in a positive way mm, yeah. and would also not represent it in a lame way because you can be inclusive in a way that like kind of waters down the content for sure Mm. and the athletes that we got are just like like i i train with christine and kira pretty much every training session yeah so i get to see that there's like no difference in how everyone pushes themselves between like age gender etc but there's not a lot of content that emphasizes or even like makes that obvious yeah i think so right and so the film is like 
in Soul Destroyer, you get to see Max looking at that Lisbon running pre that he doesn't end up doing. Yeah. And everyone knows that feeling. But you don't really get to see that with like a Hazal or mm. a Lilu or a, in this case, any of the eight athletes that we had yeah. <laughs> for Queen City. And we wanted to showcase that because there are just a lot of dudes in parkour who are young and haven't thought about it that just say things like, well, that's just like, you're not training as hard or blah, blah, blah. It's like, that's- You just don't see it. Yeah, yeah like you yeah, don't yeah. see it because you're not sense. looking and because that content doesn't exist and it hasn't been given a voice. Yeah. So yeah, for me, Queen City was like, let me step out of the way, yeah. point some cameras and then just like, let you all do your thing. And we didn't even have, from the narrative perspective, right? That was even the struggle. It's like, you want to be able to craft a story that's interesting. But in this case in particular, it's like, I don't want to put any you just want to let it pressure happen. on you all. Yeah. It's yeah. like, you're, you're getting an opportunity that none of like, I want that opportunity. Right. It's, it's cool. I've been there and you haven't had this. Yeah. So I want you to just enjoy this and we'll figure out how to film it and share that experience with the audience. God, that must've been so much fun. Yeah. Was, I mean, Everyone you could involved. talk about it more. It was really just, stressful just, for me. Just but really was fun. <laughs> is Denver known as Queen City? Because in the trailer, which is phenomenal, they all walk past like a thing and it says Denver Queen City. Is so that... the there are a couple Queen Cities, but Denver's known as the Queen City of the Plains. And what's what is a Queen City? It's just like the jewel of the ah, okay, I guess. Okay. Um, but that, that piece it, of graffiti is like, I would drive past it on my way to work every day. Is that where the inspiration came And from? that was the inspiration. And so we were like, we should definitely get that shot. Yeah, but, that's um, sick. Yeah, it was Walt Whitman coined that, who's like America's uh, poet. Yeah. And he visited Denver in the 1890s and called it the Queen City of the Plains. Because it just sits right up against the mountains. And it's like this little jewel right yeah. before you hit the Rockies. I wonder what Walt Whitman is. Uh, Breaking Bad is done for Walt Whitman's like notoriety because i would not know that name i don't think if it wasn't for breaking bad really walt whitman is in his it's the uh there's numerous walt whitman like references with regards to his like poetry and there's like a book huh. yeah. yeah leaves of grass very cool yeah very cool but, well i'll um, let christine talk about what it was actually like because yeah my experience was just like are we getting enough coverage is everyone happy is everyone hydrated remember, like you you can 100 degrees out and we've had wildfires all summer yeah i mean we, like we need to talk about this we need to talk about that i just remember you coming to me with like questions before when it was still kind of i guess in like the concept basis and it was just like i was trying to give you just rough ideas of like i can't even remember what you were asking me but it was exciting to know that like you were working on something yeah, yeah, I mostly was just like, I'm, thank God I don't have to work with a bunch of 18 year old boys. And I get to work with like 30 year old women who are all like professionals and amazing at what they yeah. do. <laughs> they made it very easy. Yeah, it was so super interesting. Cause I think Kira and I were, since we were so involved kind of on the, the it, on the front side and like more, more me than Kira, but we were kind of just like, oh, what's this? What's this going to be like? Like, yeah. what, do we, what do we think's going to happen? And um, it, it kind of was this thing that was always so far in the future. And then it was. And there. it was like, oh, like, yeah, we're going to do this at the end of August. All right, we've talked to these athletes. All right, we've kind of finalized the week. Okay, like now, uh, oh, oh, like people have tickets. Like <laughs> flights have been booked. People are coming. Oh, this is next week. Oh, like I'm picking up Alyssa from the airport today. Like it's like, oh, it was, oh, this is actually happening. Um, and so it was kind of like people came together and it was like, oh, like, nice to meet you, blah, blah, blah. And then training just kind of started happening like very immediately. And people started That's like so playing good. off of each other and getting to know each other's styles and find what people liked, what people didn't like. And everyone was just trying different things. And like the age range was was pretty big. So you had Seneca at 17 was the youngest member. And then like myself and Alyssa and and I guess Tam's like 29, but sheep were all in our thirties. Mm. And there was kind of a spread in between with like Sarah Mudalal was there and she's like in the middle. And so it was kind of this like cool spread of ages, but almost on the, the older side, which I thought actually kind of led an interesting story there in itself. Um, I guess we should, maybe we should say who's in it. Yeah, really I was gonna quick. say, yeah, 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 just quick rundown of. And you should go follow all of them on Instagram because they're all awesome if they post. But um, <laughs> obviously Christine and then Kira, yep. uh, Kira Wynn, who is also Denver based. Yep. And uh, then we had from Montreal, Tam. And I, I told this to, um, I was I saying this to you yesterday. I felt so bad because in the store awards, 
No, oh, we were in the car. Yeah, yeah in yeah. the Star Awards, they they were like, yeah, Tam, like she had a pretty good year. She just like needed more bangers. And I'm just like sitting on this treasure trove of her footage. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, Tam did a lot of really cool things last year, but I have all of them on this hard drive. Yeah. Wow. And no one will see them until 2022. And I like texted her as the Star Awards were coming out. I'm like, I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we had Tam, Alyssa Serpa from yeah. Vancouver. We uh, had this amazing athlete named Sheep who Kira had met and we'd originally wanted um, a few people and then just COVID kind of made the list get shorter and shorter. I was going to say, yeah, was the, were you trying to sort of pull from further afield and things like that? And then- there were, we didn't want to go international because at the time there were just too many travel restrictions. Yeah. Um, but there were like, like Sydney Olson was in it from the beginning and then she ended up having to miss about half of it uh, just because of like work and family How stuff. How long were you shooting for? We shot for six nights and seven days. Wow, so yeah. quite a window, like quite yeah. small, yeah. Yeah, um, we also had wanted to get Gemini Powell involved yeah. and then she bailed, she had to like bail out on it like two days beforehand because she booked a really awesome stunt job. And she was like, I'm trying to figure out how to like let them give yeah. me any time off. And it was, she was like, this is kind of like a life-changing job. I'm like, yeah, dude, go for it. You, yeah. You're good. Um, Seneca Schwartz from New York who did a TEDx talk. She's 17 now, That's but crazy. she made a documentary, <laughs> like a short film about girls like the young girls parkour community when she was in eighth grade and wow. christine had shown me her stuff and i'm like we have to get her involved like she's such a nerd and i resonated very hard <laughs> with that um and she's just awesome super mature for her age as well um sarah mudalal from la who we just trained with and am i missing anybody sheep tam Alyssa, sarah sydney you kira and oh my gosh, I am missing somebody. It's, I hate this. I do this, this all the time. This is always the worst thing. We still miss out the we amount of time. We, we forget we, people in motors. Yeah, you go through motors and you're like, I am so. <laughs> that like, shouldn't happen, really, should it? Completely forget. Sarah Sen. Oh yeah, I just no. forgot to say Seneca's name in oh, my, okay, in my yeah, finger yeah. count. But yeah. yeah, that was that was the squad. So it was like a pretty diverse geographic. Mm. range and age range yeah and also stylistically because sends like very freestyle sydney's known for style but is just a beast at everything yeah and then you kind of get like more and more to the like pure parkour side of like tam and Alyssa. fuck it's i'm just really remembering fun. i'm remembering some like half clips from the trailer and getting oh. excited there was something that tam did that looked really cool there's yeah, yeah. there's a good was, like, like, on a wall like yeah oh yeah and I mean, I think the coolest part of bringing that group of your of your peers together, like it it opened a lot of doors for people that like, I guess for like me specifically, I don't do a ton of like upper body type challenges. Like I, I don't feel like I, my legs are way stronger than my arms. I always felt like that was kind of an unaccessible part of training. Like I just didn't, I sucked at it. And Tam is so much, so many crazy upper body yeah, like pulling yeah. challenges and for and and that just like training with somebody at a similar like level to you and appear to you like makes that way more accessible feeling um and i think that was seen all around yeah like, folks that didn't do flips were like trying flips for the first time people who didn't do like big plyo challenges were trying those like it was it was very cool like cross pollination, pollination. Yeah. that's so good and what was the like the what kind of boundaries did you put around the not narrative so to speak but it was like cool we've got a limited amount of time yeah is that just what are, training are we are we just day? training are we going to specific spots like oh guys it would kind of be cool if you broke this challenge or like you, yeah. yeah there were a few things that i so i did like pre interviews with all the athletes to just kind of like vibe out what they wanted out of the trip yeah. so that i could set an itinerary like that, filmed interviews or like literally i did them on on like as zoom interviews oh, so yeah, yeah. um and i didn't really think of like using them mm-hmm. I, I i had it as an option but it didn't end up working yeah very well in the film um but it was mostly just so that i could like talk to everybody again and kind of get to know the people that i didn't know in person mm. and see if there were going to be any weird like character conflicts or somebody's like i actually just sleep until 2 p.m every day and i only train for like an hour it's like oh okay good to know (laughs) (laughs) um but a couple people had some goals of like spots they wanted to go to tam was like well i'm going to colorado 
you know I want to look at some descents. Yeah. And I was like, all right, that's good to know. We can we can take a, a peek at that. I was um, gonna say, so Denver ended up being was that basically because of COVID slash also it's Denver. Like Yeah, Denver was just yeah. it's it was easiest organizationally. Um, the people who shot it, so Sean Endries is my partner yeah, at Point I was gonna A. Say, we need to, yeah. yeah, and Sean is an awesome cinematographer who moved to Denver a couple years ago. Yep. So I knew that I had Sean there. We had a couple other like local filmmakers that were able to like be and see op on yep. camera stuff. And then Kent Johns came down and he was our gimbal op and B camera for like four of the days. He's in Montana, so it was relatively close for him. Yeah. And then we had Kent and Casey shooting film for the entire project as well. So we have a bunch of stills that'll be coming out as prints and a photo book yeah. to accompany the project. And Denver was just very, it's very central. Mm. Um, so it's easy for kind of everybody to fly into and just logistically, like we know where all the spots are. Yeah. We knew that we'd be able to host a couple people. We were able to put everybody else up in an Airbnb. And that was the other thing um, that I really need to say is originally, the other athlete we wanted was Lorena Abreu and she had like stress fractures and all these other health things. So she didn't want to come on as an athlete, not knowing what she'd be able to do. Uh, and then couldn't come on on production because she was working a job at the time. I actually think it's the Dr. Strange movie that just came out. Oh really? Yeah. yeah and she sick. was like, she was working something timing wise would probably be. Yes. Yeah, the good things. Yeah. I've got a film. <laughs> exactly. Um, but as I was like on this like Zoom pre-interview with her, her mom overheard our conversation and Lorena and her mother are opening this amazing facility called Cascaya in South Texas yeah. uh, in a couple months. And I was like, yeah, I really want to make it a thing where we get a rental car for all the athletes to have to drive. We get an Airbnb for them to stay in so everybody has a bed to sleep in. We pay per diem for food so that you can eat what you want and not have to worry about it. We pay everybody for their time. We pay everybody that's filming. But obviously then it becomes a question of who do you get to sponsor it? Yep. And Lorena's mom was like, put together a budget proposal. And if I'm the only sponsor, like if Kiskea is down to make it happen because it's just a cool project that doesn't exist. Uh -huh. And I put together the budget proposal and she's like, yeah, we can make that happen. I was going to ask you like, yeah, uh, well, where, did, how did you fund it? But yeah. yeah, this is amazing. And it's like the, especially with the athletes that we picked, like at the time, I think because of COVID Tam wasn't working, but like she was working full-time animation before that. Alyssa moved out to like rural British Columbia and she's working on an organic farm oh, doing sick. like sustainable farming practices. Um, Sheep was coaching full time. Christine's a rocket scientist, aerospace engineer. Kira was working full time. Sen was in school, so she was like the only one that so kind of had a free schedule. Work, yeah, yeah right. and it's hard to be like, hey, take a week where you're gonna lose a Money. grand, yeah, to make nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and the goal was like, you maybe won't be making as much as you would in your normal job, right? But it's like you're not gonna lose, yeah, a bunch. You gave them such focused training time, yeah. And like per diem, even things just like per diem. Yeah, yeah, and that's the goal with like every project, right? Is uh, a huge inspiration for me on that end is Movement Creative in New York. Jesse Danger's done that from day one. He's like, I want to pay my coaches this much. It's a living wage in New York. It's much more than anybody else is paying parkour coaches in the US. Yeah. I will pay out of pocket until I can create a business model that allows me to do that sustainably. And that's what he has done from day one. It wasn't like, well, in the future, like we'll be able to pay you more than minimum wage. It was like, I will dramatically inconvenience myself yeah, yeah, yeah. to like create this business model. And then if it fails, like it's on me and I need to figure it out. Yeah. Um, and we were super lucky that Kiskea basically came in and they were like, yeah, we'll take a lot of stress off your shoulders right at the beginning and make this happen. And that was when it became the like, it would be cool to do this as the first film but logistically it's really really hard to like well we have the budget to actually make the logistics happen and now it's just a matter of like doing, doing it, it all yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Okay, you're like shit there's no excuses now yeah so Got the boundaries in terms of that was basically just yeah what do you what do the like all the athletes want to do what are their goals for the trip for themselves and like where's everybody at health wise yeah um and then just I wanted to take everybody to the spots I thought they'd enjoy, like the coolest spots in like the Denver metro area. Sick. And did you have like a, in your head, 
a kind of a vision for what you thought it could be and has it does it feel like it's head in that direction or did, like i think probably like any major thing in some ways it came out so much better than i expected it look i'm so <laughs> impressed <laughs> with so well done. So i'm so impressed with so how i think in some like, ways right it came out way better and then you see it and with anything that you love you like you want to see it grow more yeah right so you're like i definitely see the areas where like i'm excited on the next project yeah. to grow in these areas at, like on a production standpoint um but from what the athletes did and what they brought to the table and the energy it was like it was such an amazing experience to be a part of and when you rap when you rap on that last day and everybody is just like the energy of the group knowing like okay we just finished this amazing amazing thing mm -hmm. that feeling is so immensely satisfying and i imagine like you knew like you felt it with rca yeah where you yeah. like the entire group's putting so much focus and energy into creating something together and it's like not a thing you get in parkour very much no, because it's yeah. such an yeah that last sport. night on the roof and roof culture was like wow yeah like, mm -hmm. it was a lot of like wow we were all still alive like there was death. <laughs> legitimately it was like wow we no one got fucking hurt but mm -hmm. yeah no it was crazy that must we have been sad for everyone sorry i'm cutting you no, I was just saying we never got that with Soul Destroyer because we planned on carrying on filming and then COVID hit and it was yeah. like, oh, we get to start editing. Or anything. <laughs> yeah. So it must have been sad for everyone training for part of it because like after the days of, fin well, after the project, it's like, well, yeah. all my yeah. friends are now disappearing back to, it like, was. when does that chance, when do you have the chance again, you know? Back yeah. into more lockdowns. Yeah, yeah, we like finished, we wrapped like the final interviews and like people were like, we, were, we actually ended up the last day at Eric Madrid's gym um in south denver and we did the final interviews and then it was just like oh yeah like we did the thing like yeah sick but it was also just like man everyone's yeah. gonna leave tomorrow <laughs> and also it's weird with films as well because it's like then there's this just this dead area where like the main is 90 percent of the people involved with it kind of don't really do or have to do anything and then it just relies on like the editor and stuff and it's like yeah. It just went out. Like, what, what, when do we get excited about the final thing again? Like, and it's I, really strange. I think that's been what's very cool to be where I'm at, because like, no work is being done by me on the on <laughs> the actual you get to, film. You get to but see I, it. But I, I like, it's. Oh yeah, I reworked this section. Like, take a look at it, and it's like, oh, I reworked this section. Like, take a look at it. It's like, and I've seen the cut end to end. And then he'll rework sections of it. And I'm like, I have no idea what it actually looks like like today. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what it looks like. And so that's that's been pretty cool. And I've like been very, very impressed with with how it came together and like how much work you've put into it. And I don't think I had like a real appreciation for how hard that actually is to go do until I actually watched you do it it's yeah the finished piece is just a fraction of the work that goes in always hearing you guys talk about the how about soul i'm like oh i know that feeling way Which, I, too well, well so <laughs> this is where i think because you i mean you've edited before right yeah. never anything like this no and you keenan's exactly the same and, and so sort of max and sam and things like it's that working on a bigger thing that you edit a section and then you think it's done and then you do some other bits and then you come back to it and you're like it doesn't work and it's yeah I think that's the struggle like with uh, it's not a struggle but i think the benefit of this piece is that the strength of it isn't determined by how cool my transitions are yeah mm. right it's like the, this piece isn't about point a doing anything and that's been the benefit of having christine and kira to like run sections by is like am i am i telling something that feels like accurate and feels representative that, to you as well like, you are that's almost like you're doing so much more mm. because yeah. you're not speaking through like as you said transitions or whatever it's like yeah it's the the, the it's almost harder the I think. body the I body think of point a is taken it's telling that story and it's like yeah. that's the empower you're empowering and that's like mm. for sure cool but thing. on the good end it's not like it is just like i get to step back and lift up the voices of other people yeah and i think that the nice thing right there's a huge imposter syndrome feeling when you're trying to start something like this especially because I'm like, I have, I have no background in film, like other than being on the front end of it. Yeah. And even on the back end with Sean, it's like, there's so much that you learn through the process. And the exciting thing is like, we have two more, we don't have two more full length features, but we have a, a short feature 
and then another short feature that we're shooting, one's two thirds of the way done. So our goal is to put out minimum three pieces before the end of this year. That's sick. I was gonna ask what's yeah. next. Yeah. And we have uh, eventually like the goal would be to get, yeah, like four annually that are in the like 20 to 40 minute range, like yeah. narrative nonfiction. And that's amazing and exciting. And you're gonna learn so much with every process. So for me, that takes a bit of the pressure off because it's like, let's let's do this and parkour is a safe enough space that I feel like I can come on the modus project, you know, the modus broadcast. And I'm not like Giles is going to harass me about <laughs> my like lack of editing expertise. I can be fully transparent. And it's like, this is where we want to go with this yeah. because we know that there's a community behind us that wants this type of content yeah. and wants to lift voices of people who are telling really cool stories. So in that sense, it's like it eases some of the anxiety because you know you know, I get to just push out a something that folks are going to see that they've never seen before yeah. and step back. And like, I can take notes on where to improve and just do better like the next the time. And like with that style of edit as well, like from an editing perspective, it's the best style of thing to make. And it's also, it's, unless you literally butcher it, you know, like just, just <laughs> cut halfway through an interview to like a fucking clip of SpongeBob or whatever. Like it's, it's so hard to go like, oh, Max ruined the editing because at the end of the day, you're <laughs> yeah. you're you're stepping back and you're being like, it's not about fucking me and my editing skills. It's about this. Yeah, you're engaging like, with I, the people. Yeah, like, I that's much the goal. prefer that. Like it, in the lot, I love an editing flex occasionally for certain things, but I in the, the wider perspective, the the content is always it's it's the same. Just a generic parkour video. I've always said, like, if you're a parkour photographer, videographer your goal is showcasing the parkour. Mm. Like, yes, you can flex on certain edits, but if you ruin the parkour because you're editing flexing, you've ruined the parkour. Like your subject yeah. matter is the parkour. Yeah. And in, in this perspective, it's like, it's not obviously just the parkour, but it's the, the story, it's mm. everything, so. Yeah, and we're lucky that we got on, like on the, on the production side, like we got some of the most talented cinematographers and videographers in the US parkour scene. And on the post side, it's like, we got Toby to edit the trailer. Yeah, Toby's yeah. helping with the finishing edit potentially as yeah. well. So, you know, it is like, that was always like, I'd meant one of the reasons I talked to you as well. Initially, I'm like, hey, do you think that like you or Johnston would be interested or mm. Kia, somebody like in taking some aspect because point A isn't tied to a group? I was going to say this. So as it expands and you want to tell more stories, is it like, will you try and outsource more things and be like, because I'm in a production company, sort of typically yeah. essentially just goes cool like here's a story let's put the money in and put the people behind it and then fund that and make it happen like yeah so i think that ideally it provides a platform for the talented creatives to come in and be employed yeah. to do the thing that they love yeah uh i think the challenge up front is on the like direction end I, there isn't the content there that you can point to and be like, we want something that feels like this in the parkour space. So there's a lot of like, lot that can be lost in translation. So I think what we want to do is create a little bit of a portfolio oh, for sure. as yeah. we develop it so that it's like, Hey, when someone comes in, if we hire Keelan to do like a 20 minute cut, right? It's like, we know what that process looks like on the back end, yeah. and we can communicate it efficiently mm -hmm. and we have something to show those people where it's like this is what we want the finished edit to feel like yeah because you so it, that they can shoot for as that. much as you mm -hmm. sort of said like point a isn't a brand it's like you you'll have a a feel of yeah. your productions mm -hmm. like yeah. you'll have a kind of not necessarily an aesthetic but it's like there'll be certain criteria that it's like this is a point a thing yeah and as you delegate it is obviously you don't want to just go you in Australia, go make something and then it comes in and it's completely different totally and like, for me the criteria the main criteria is like letting the people behind the sport speak for themselves yeah, and giving that depth because as a practitioner, you know, that's always the most interesting part of somebody is their story. And that's why podcasts are cool. Yeah. And it's just one of those things where, yeah, let, like let's get a library where we get our hands dirty, practicing, telling those stories and, and giving that, uh, building that space a little bit. And then when we want to outsource and as we potentially do outsource more to tell stories that are more diverse around the world, we have that portfolio to draw from and we can communicate it intelligibly so that it stays consistent and people ideally see the point A logo on something and they're like, cool, I'm going to get a really, really interesting story, something that I haven't heard before 
and I know to expect that it's is not it, going to be yeah. like a training video that's yeah. 20 minutes long or something. Is it like, is it A64, the film studio? A64? Mm, the sure one that know. does like... 84. Is it 84? Yeah. For, for as in like films. 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 Yeah, yeah. And you know when you when it's an 84 film, it's going to get... That's true, actually. Yeah. 84, it's like, it's going to get weird. Like, yeah. It's going to be sc- <laughs> yeah, kind of scary but, but and it's going to be weird. Very well made. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You're you like, this that. is going to flip right. me upside down a little bit. Like, yeah. And like in climbing, there's a, like Sender Films is in Boulder. They're the ones mm. that do the Real Rock Festival. Yeah, yeah. And that's like, if there's a Sender Films logo on it or like Louder Than 11 is another one that I really enjoy, I know I'm going to get something that like hits my feels. Yeah. Yeah. And also like connects me to really cool movement. But ultimately is like about a person that does the thing. Every mm. every podcast we've done recently, I just like, just I'm just like, fuck, there's so much stuff that I want to do as well. Cause it's like, I love, I, I listen to this kind of thing. And I've, we've always said like most, we want to do more like, you know, making films and telling stories and stuff. I mean, that's the great thing about too, like what, where I wanted to come from is I like, there's no, um, right. If it's not a brand, there's no competition yeah, in that yeah, sense yeah, yeah, as yeah. well. So it's like, if you need another, like if you need somebody to be a PA or an executive producer, cause you can't handle it eventually like in an ideal world right that's a situation where modus as a brand could have a conversation with point a to figure out what that would look like Fun, to come on as a collaborative there's, there's something productive. I should run past you yeah but yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah like it's that's so sick it's so nice that like that's your kind of your positioning almost it's like this is what we're gonna do um it's so crazy how that gap hadn't been filled until now if that makes sense i yeah. think it's hard documentary space people have talked about it right yeah. and i've i've talked about it and i'm not afraid to talk about it also because you guys know how much work it is it's not like somebody can just come in it's the commitment as well and roll out four films and well, be yeah, like and all right it's, we're it's done sustaining <laughs> itself as well because it's like i'm assuming yeah. are you always going to be trying to look for outside sponsorship which i guess it makes total sense to do that um but i'm assuming you'll try and sell this and then sort of reinvest and, and keep yeah. going. And yeah, and Queen City, is, it will be a, a for purchase. Yeah. What I'm really trying to figure out, just like with Parkour Roadmap, and I haven't quite figured out what it looks like yet, but I really want to offer some type of um, either scale, like sliding scale purchase system yeah. where, you know, if you are someone who like us has a full-time job and you can pay $20 to buy the film, you can hit the top sliding scale and that helps cover the people who are in another country where the, their currency isn't as strong. And maybe for them, like $2 to buy the film is mm. the most that they can do. Yeah. Cause they obviously you can do like name your price things, but then they just get abused and everyone puts one, like zero, one dollar yeah. and things. And, and I was like, really impressed when I did parkour roadmap, like it gave me a bit more faith Yeah. for most of the people who took advantage of the free option. There were a few and they were like, I am a student How in did you- Norway. It was literally like you could just submit a form on the website. And if you filled out the whole form, I would by hand go through it and send you the PDF. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so there was actual effort. It was actual, it. like so a like, bit of effort. That's good. Cause otherwise people would just. Yeah. That's the thing. <laughs> yeah. that, I mean, even just like the way that we have like our digital media on the website is it runs through a system and I can see basically if the IP addresses and things get used, uh, abused and like, you see so much piracy. Yeah. Like just, they get a link and they just share, 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 share. And yeah, and then you, you hear stories, you put all this work in something and you release it and you hear stories about people who are like, oh yeah, this guy sent it to like 20 people and you're like, fuck's sake. Like, and it kind of, it, it adds up and it's like a little bit like, oh, and you don't, you obviously don't, you need this sort of return on investment. So it's like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. Cause it does have to be a model that's sustainable. Yeah. But I think that, um, you know, I think that there's there's the two sides of that coin. Hopefully it's successful enough that, you know, if people see it, that they want to pirate it, that'd be great. You know, that's awesome in its own way. Um, and I think on the flip side, you know, depending on how you market it, like there's so many amazing people in parkour that want to support this type of content. Mm. And we're trying to reach out to them, a lot of them in person as well. And it's like, Hey, I know that you want to support this and make this sustainable. So let's provide an option where like you can give what you would want to give yeah. in an ideal world. And then hopefully whatever surplus from that gives us the chance to figure out a way to make it, especially for this film where it's such a topic that needs to reach people. Like I want the community in India or in, you know, Peru or Colombia or 
Southeast Asia yeah. to be able to have access to this. Mm. Um, and I think that's like been a huge priority for how we've kind of talked about modeling the sales. That's I think so that'll sick. keep you inspired to keep going as well. Yeah. If it's just accessibility and stuff. Yeah. It's so needed. I think, I think uh, also once people see the trailer, they'll like, I don't think you're going to have issues selling it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I hope I hope they'll be stoked. Yeah, Toby killed it with the trailer. Yeah. But I mean, it's, it's so like, funny. Like, been... but it's not even like Toby's flexed on the trailer. No, like, no. It's, no. it's just the quality of the filming and also the snippets of interview and the, the glimpses into the movement and things. It's just like, you get a very good idea of the story as soon as you watch the trailer. Yeah. yeah you're think... like, yeah, I can see what I'm about to watch. Uh, for it's anyone, the, when, the trailer isn't online yet, but when is it? Do you have a date? Soon. Soon. Yeah. We're, okay. Yeah. I'm waiting on music releases. Basically. Yeah. So don't don't go look for it because you won't find anything. But it will be out. <laughs> We've got we it. Do so have we the can teaser. keep watching it. We have the teaser on the Point A Instagram. Yeah. And that is right now our the best way. If you do want to follow, it's just at Point A Parkour, mm -hmm. and we are just gonna kind of keep like dripping out information. And then once we have all the permissions and stuff, we'll do like a big push to yeah, make sure that everybody knows what's going on. But yeah, that's the best place right now to to keep in track with everything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and even I mean the the trailer is obviously the like but the 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 teaser does does kind of give you a vibe. The the trailer is very true to the way the film feels yeah. as well, which I think is it's definitely the mark of a good trailer where it, it touches on some cool stuff, but it's not all the cool stuff. And mm. also you don't want it to over, like not oversell, but also create a vibe that doesn't exist in the film, which mm. can trailer yeah. is so easy to go like epic and then the film is completely different yeah right? yeah and i think this one i think it nailed it yeah i was just gonna say that's how i felt watching every dc movie for like 10 years <laughs> you know, the trailer get me so excited as a comic book nerd and then you're like god batman versus <laughs> superman really like that's the movie come on <laughs> yeah we were aware of trying to not do a, a batman versus superman situation on that yeah yeah sick um i feel like we've covered we've covered some really good points that i wanted to go into actually what, what else have we Oh, fires. You, so you were battling wildfires oh. and you said there was fucking ash falling from yeah, the sky. Yeah, so what? it's the thing While that you're- While training for it. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah it's yeah, the thing that you're not gonna like really get necessarily. I think we, we actually did, ended up adding an interview to kind of at least touch on it. But it was it was summer in Colorado, which means- Everything's on fire. Everything's on fire. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was probably about a hundred degrees every day, which is- 40 Celsius, what? 38 to 40. To 40. And <sighs> um, there were wildfires on the West Coast and the ash just blows in. And so it was just, it was smoky. I think we had the, we were like recording the worst air quality of a major city in the world during like that week. That's fucked. Um, and so mm. like- Whilst needing the oxygen to train. <laughs> and also, was anyone- And it was elevation. <laughs> yeah, was so anyone struggling with elevation? Um, so everyone, I think, did really well. I think Kira and I were actually the most affected because we'd just been in it longer because we were from Colorado. Yeah. Um, but I, I just remember, like, my eyes were itchy. It was, like, allergies were awful. Like, and it, it's just impressive to see, like, the level of co quality content that came out with just, like, that extra added. You've got, like, like Kent and people just wiping the lens, like, ash off the lenses constantly. <laughs> yeah, and so <laughs> it was... It was <laughs> It was quite a bit of fun. I think everyone, we did one like rest day in the river and it was just like a very cleansing, like yeah. jump in the river, cool down. I've got like images of like, you know, just completely gray volcano people. <laughs> okay, it was like, not quite like that. Um, <laughs> jumping in the river. Yeah, like, it's more just like imagine all of the surfaces on like the, there were like two, one or two really bad days and the other days were just like really hot and dusty. Yeah. But it's basically like when you go to like an undercover spot, like in a, parking garage or something and, and you that. rub a rail and it's just got like grime on it yeah. it's basically just that on everything like wow. a thin layer of God. like dusty grime we had a sahara and uh, sahara yeah storm yeah there was a storm in the sahara that blew over like this way a couple of weeks ago and we just came out and all the car like the sky the whole day was kind of weirdly orange and then all the cars were just covered in like uh, sand dust yeah crazy. all pretty the way weird. from there mm. um that's crazy is there anything else we need to cover? That's kind of kind of everything. Is there anything else you guys want to touch on regarding it? Like, thanks for letting us talk about it. No, I'm I'm <laughs> fucking excited. Like, I'm I think the one thing I would almost say, and we've been speaking a lot about it with Soul, is like we keep. I I just came up with a stupid boiling the kettle analogy, didn't I? Like boiling what? the pot. 
Oh yeah. But I'm just like, make sure you hype it. I mean, this will obviously help and you're gonna do a podcast mm. with Callum, right? And like, I think just like you, we, the thing we learned with Soul Destroy is we definitely overhyped it because of just schedules and things, but it definitely played to our advantage in the sense that when it came out, it was like frothy, like mm. everyone kind of jumped <laughs> on it. And I think having seen some other releases over the last couple of years, some people think they've hyped it a bit because they've put a trailer out and they've put a few things on Instagram mm. and then it's done, it's done fine. But like to combat that initial piracy, you almost want everyone chomping at the bit to buy it that day rather than like, oh, I'll pick it up next week. Yeah. So it's like, I, I was saying to the guys, it's like boil the water and like get it, like the, the bubbly excitement, really, really get it boiling and uh. then drop it. You need to do a little bit better because I didn't know you guys were making a thing. Exactly. <laughs> this is what I mean. This is what I mean. So it's but like, on the like on the flip side of that, I think what you exactly what you said was my uh, Soul Destroyer not really being the best example because it actually came out, but there are so many projects that just like get hyped. Yeah. Mm. You're like, when's that coming out? And it's like, oh well, the, the guy that was editing it like doesn't do parkour anymore actually, and then yeah. this happened, and so Storm America, especially was a good since one for this that. was our first project, <laughs> we all were like, all right. We're just going to be very quiet about it yeah. until we know for sure, like it's basically done. Yeah. We mm. have everything. This set. feels like the start of it. Like, this is, your, like this is your press tour. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's exactly what it's like. It's like, we've got, we've got the, almost the finishing edit cut. Things are, are getting like to the finishing stages where we know the timeline. Yeah. And now we're like, yes. And we're so excited to share this with everybody. And it's been really, really awesome to get the chance to hop on and talk to people. Yeah. You guys want to see the first couple minutes of it after this? Yes. Oh. Yes. I mean, yeah, to, to anyone say, listening, like the trailer is phenomenal and it will come out when it's ready. And a hundred percent, like we speak about it so much, but paid m sort of media is an incredible way to support initiatives like this and other things uh, for a number of reasons. But it's just like, just, just buy it when it comes out, basically, if you can buy it. And I will say, in case anyone's asking, I feel comfortable. We haven't finalized a price for it, but for the 45 minute piece uh, purchase price, we're looking between five and seven dollars. So it's yeah. not like it's going to be, you know, you're basically like buying me an oat cappuccino. <laughs> <laughs> like a fancy from your, yeah, is that yeah. from your place? Yeah. Or you can buy me like a, it's like a meal deal, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we want it to feel Everyone in affordable. England goes, oh, okay. Oh, meal, meal deal. <laughs> meal deal. Yeah, yeah, deal. Yeah. No, it is like a universal in England. It's like, oh, the price of a meal deal. <laughs> yeah. Maybe two meal deals, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, it's, if, if you want the sport to grow, you can't be just assuming everything comes for free. Like, yeah. that's, yeah. if you want to invest back in back into your own sport and create the opportunities, like, we've got, we've got it as a community. Realize that the world isn't free and life isn't free and nothing, nothing that you get for free is actually free to... No, yeah, it yeah, doesn't yeah, just yeah, yeah. appear out of the yeah. sky as God's gift to whatever. <laughs> yeah, and also like I think I, it can be kind of reiterated, even though we said it before. But like the the reason why digital content is so good from like a sort of just a straight up financial business standpoint is that you put in money into it, you make one thing, which it's the same with software. You can sell that film over and over again. So from a from a profit perspective for whoever's created it, it opens so many more doors than like shirts or whatever which you have to restock and there's 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 so much more in that sense so like from like point a standpoint it's yeah it's incredibly important to support this kind of thing basically so fucking do it yeah i will be uh pirating soul though yeah do it, do it do it <laughs> <laughs> send us a video message That's of it so too. much yeah. more effort than just paying film, for guys. it mate i don't understand people who still like they come like i don't know sometimes someone like Robbie maybe like be around the house and we'll be like, oh, there's a film we want to see and it's not on Netflix or something. Mm. And he'll like start trying to like find a site to get it. And it will be on Apple, like you can buy it. long winded and then you can buy it or rent it for like anyway. three quid. And I'm like, is the film half decent? Like, do we really want to watch it? It's like, it's three pounds. Like just we'll fucking buy it. I hate the like sit on a laptop for half an hour trying to find a good, copy and then it's shit and it's <laughs> fuck that it's like, like just watch the, the time is worth more than the fucking yeah oh mm. yeah don't get me started on people are like oh you'll pay the toll to drive a, like yes because my time is yeah. worth more yeah, yeah, yeah. you have to you have to set a time, time is like worth. i mean the, there's literally <laughs> a i made a mistake with that comment you wrapped it up so nicely <laughs> 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 the rants there is there's that you should set a, a figure for your time and be like i'm not going beyond that 
Like it's yeah. Yeah, but thank you. I seriously appreciate both <laughs> of you guys. Before, we, for before the podcast spiral. <laughs> <laughs> I've had too much experience with Brandon on height drop. I know where this goes. <laughs> you guys are awesome. And I listen to every Modus episode while I roast my coffee. So I appreciate that very much. Podcast is high on the list. This is a very true statement, and I get very angry. It's the one time I try to use my Spotify account, and he's listening to... Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> well, yeah, thanks very much. Um, yeah, support it when it comes out. Support us. We make, we're make. we also making it... Well, I say we, Keelan, and that lot are also making something that will be out soon. Um, what else is going on? Comment, like, subscribe, that kind of thing. Mm. And we're going to watch two minutes of it now. Yeah. Oh, you can watch yeah. more than two. Yeah. And if you... I might even say three. Ooh. And follow point A. Yes, at, yeah. At point I'll, A I'll, I'll put all the the bits in the description. I'm so bad links. at doing that, so I have to remind myself. I'm, I'm, we're we're just awful with this, with the formality of it. So, mm-hmm. yeah. But uh, yeah, are we awesome. we good. Love you lots. Does anyone anyone want to reach over and press the button? Keenan's gonna red rock one. out. Big red one. one right here. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Mine. You really just hear it. <laughs> Beautiful.